Hi, everybody. I'm Molly Heffernan, Director of Marketing for the Tory Birch Foundation. And welcome to our small business webinar series. I want to first start with a really big thank you to our sponsor, Campaign Monitor. They have helped make this entire series happen, and it is a free and accessible series for small business owners because of their support. So we are incredibly grateful for their partnership. Now, with the world and so many customers online, and many of us online, uh, today's e-commerce workshop is a super important topic and one that we get questions about all the time. So to equip us with the right knowledge, we have a fantastic expert, and some of you may remember her since you have tuned into our sessions before. Um, we have Regine Gilbert here today with us, and she is a user experience designer and total expert, um, and we are gonna learn so much. Um, she's the author of Inclusive Design for a Digital World, Designing with Accessibility in Mind. Super important. And she's on a mission to make the world ultimately a more accessible place and one that starts and ends with the user. She's also an industry assistant professor at the NYU Tannen School of Engineering. So needless to say, we are in the most fantastic hands today and have a lot to learn. She will be covering how you can all build the best online shopping experience and booking experience for your customers. Um, after today's presentation, we'll have lots of time for Q&A. Um, so throughout the session, as those questions come to mind, put them in the Q&A box. Um, so different from the chat box. Chat is where we all want you to get to know each other. Q&A box, that's where we're going to be looking for the questions to answer today. So drop them in there for us, and we will do our very best to answer as many questions as we can. So with that, Regine, over to you. Uh, thank you, Molly, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I saw Alexa has a business that is, is dealing with bees, uh, and and I did some beekeeping over the weekend, which was very exciting. So I, I can't wait to look uh, look up your business. All right, so I am going to share my screen. I just want to make sure I am good. You all can see it. Yes, Molly? You can see me. I screen. can see it. Okay, wonderful. All right, so uh, thank you for the introduction. I am a designer, educator, and author, and I have spent a lot of years actually working in e-commerce um, uh, with different businesses, big and small. So I wanna first start off with uh, talking about what e-commerce is. So e-commerce is an online place where products and services can be bought and sold, and e-commerce can be completed online or related to a physical store. So there's different types of businesses, right? So you all have different types of businesses. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and I will say that the most important thing that you get out of being a, a part of events like this is the community um, because all of you have something to give uh, to each other. So don't, don't lose that community. So there's business to business, right? So B2B, um, think about Amazon business. There's B to C, business to consumer, something like hotels.com. And then there's C to C, which is consumer to consumer, which is something uh, like Etsy. So what might work for your business? Well, the truth is it depends. It depends. It depends on a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, so there's, there's different types of, of e-commerce platforms out there. They're static, right? Um, where you show an online presence and provide information about the business. I have a friend who has a, a consulting business and she only has the web page with contact information. And that's it. Because a lot of her business has been spread through word of mouth. Uh, she doesn't feel the need to have a website presence. There's transactional, which this site will allow for purchase of goods and services and it may be online or connected to a physical store. So if you have a physical uh, physical store, you may have an online presence as well. And people can do transactions there. And then there's marketplaces. So marketplaces are online platforms where businesses or individuals can sell, sell their products. So what type of e-commerce platform depends on what your 
needs are, depends on you, depends on what your business uh, is doing. So I'm gonna just go over some of the top e-commerce platforms. Um, this is not a list from anywhere but me just like saying, which ones are the ones that people use kind of the most? So Shopify, Wix, Squarespace, WooCommerce, Magento. Um, personally, I use Squarespace. I don't, my website is nothing but a big photo of me, uh, some of the talks that I've done and my book because I'm not really, I'm not pursuing anything. I'm not really looking anything. And I, I think I started a blog, but I haven't really started a blog. So um, depending on what your needs are, right? Um, so Shopify, some pros and cons. So Shopify offers a lot of value and it's easy to set up. The cons are that it has limited customization and the add-on apps can get expensive. Wix um, is simple to use and they have great themes, um, but the cons are that there are limited options and if you decide to use the free plan, it has the Wix branding. So if you had a particular brand uh, pr branding that you wanted to showcase, um, the Wix will kind of cover that up. There's Squarespace. Uh, Squarespace has nice templates and designs and uh, you can do uh, editing on your mobile, app, uh, mobile device. The cons are that it has uh, limited customization and it's not good for very large sites. There's WooCommerce, which is um, uh, like WordPress. Um, the pros are that you can you have a, a nice choice of templates and a nice presentation of the products. And the cons are that it can be difficult to use and there's limited support. Then there's Magento. This is really good if you're um, uh, scaling, you're, you're kind of bigger because you have uh, many customization options. The con is the, co the cost hands down and the setup and configuration. So some of you may not have a business that is selling things, but you may be scheduling things. So you may uh, be more services. So this is from HubSpot. Of course, they put themselves first, but I thought this list was great. Um, HubSpot meetings, calendar, set more, uh, simply book, square appointments, appointlet, doodle, Calendly. I personally use Calendly and I like it a lot. And a lot of these integrate with uh, e-commerce platforms, or you may choose to use them on uh, their own. In addition, uh, some of you may use email for marketing purposes, and there are some uh, email integrations that can be used with e-commerce platforms. Like, I may not be pronouncing this right, Clavio, uh, Omnisend, uh, Conversio, Rare.io, and Remarket. Remarket remarket tea. And these are free and paid options. Obviously, um, you have limits in terms of the number of emails you can send and such. But scheduling and uh, email are things that you can integrate into your e-commerce platforms. So let's talk about marketplace. So marketplace is where you choose to sell something on, let's say, for example, Amazon or Walmart, Walmart, or eBay, or Wayfair, or Etsy. Um, so there's pros and cons to all of these. Amazon, we all know it, right? So it's easy to get started, and uh, you could grow through Amazon. The cons are copycats and counterfeits, and high commissions. For Walmart, there's uh, limited fees and less competition than Amazon. And the cons are that it's a first come, first serve. Uh, so if somebody else is out there with a product, they may get, get out there before you. And there's also reduced margins. With Etsy, the pros are that it's easy to set up and there's a built-in audience. And the cons are that there's lots of competition and that Etsy takes a percentage of your profit. With Wayfair, for those, I saw there was a furniture person on here. Um, the pros are that there's increased reach and it's easy to sign up. The cons are lots of competition and it is specific to uh, furniture and home goods. And then eBay, the pros, uh, easy to set up. You can sell different types of products and the cons are that you have limited control of listings and there is a lot of competition. So what do you need to consider? Um, 
when you are thinking about e-commerce and what you want to do, consider your brand, right? What 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 does your brand need? What financially can you do? <laughs> you know the the budget. Um, when it comes to the products and and services that you're going to provide on a potential site, what does that look like? And then the biggest thing, and this is the biggest thing with small business owners that I I did consulting for a while uh, with my own small business, um, is who's going to maintain the site? Because a lot of folks think, I'm going to make a site. I've made a site. Or somebody made it for me, and now I don't know how to update it. Or I don't know how to fix it. And so I think one of the bigger things to consider is maintenance. How are you maintaining the site? So where do you begin? Um, determine your budget. What do you have? Um, do you have the time slash resources to build a site yourself? Um, you know, you have to find a plan that meets your needs. Pick a domain name. Hopefully your name isn't taken, right? And, and you got to check to see if it's available and then purchase it. Um, and then maintenance again, who's going to maintain it? Because I, I think that's something people think about all the different things that they have to do when running a business, but maintaining your site is, is something to consider. So choosing an e-commerce platform, you want something that's easy to set up. So look for things that are easy to set up if you're doing it yourself. And if you're hiring someone, again, think about maintenance. Integration for payments. If you have a transactional site, how will you handle payments? PayPal, credit cards, etc. And how would you issue refunds? These are things that you need to think about. You want to set yourself up for success. I think a lot of people think, "Oh, what if I don't do if I don't do well? What if Oprah decides to put your product in the magazine?" You know, how would you handle this influx of orders um so you have to think about you know how how would you handle that if that were the case and cost you know some sites are free and some can cost thousands what's going to work best for you so here's some common um, e-commerce questions you know conversion so conversion is when visitors complete a desired action so one question is, how do I motivate the customer to go ahead with the purchase after adding to the cart? What push is needed for that nudge? You want to motivate customers to move from cart to conversion by making the process seamless. Don't add extras to block the user from com completing their purchase. Cart abandonment. So what are some changes I should consider to my e-commerce site to decrease abandoned carts? So you can decrease abandonment rates by doing things like guest checkout. Um, I don't know about you all, but there are some sites that I am I am signed up for, but I can't remember my password at the, you know, I try once and I don't remember and I just want to check out as a guest. And that's one way to kind of ease cart abandonment if you, if you can make things as seamless as possible um, um, for folks or make it easy to transition from the cart to the store if people want to go back. How do I encourage new customers to check out uh, the first time? So less is more, always. You know, understand your users' needs and define the most important tasks that they need to do in order to, to reach their desired goal. Think about the steps that, you know, think about a, a time where you wanted to purchase something and you just, <laughs> you couldn't because it was, it was so complex. Don't do that. Don't do that to your customers. How can I better understand customers? You want to familiar, familiarize yourself with user experience. Um, some of you may not be familiar with user experience or uh, heard of what it is. Um, my personal definition of user experience is either people feel good using a product or they don't. There's very little in between. We've all dealt with, let's say, any sort of government website. In general, they're not, they're not very user friendly, right? And I don't feel good uh, at the end. But there are things that I've used that I feel great. Um, so familiar, familiarize yourself with user experience, get to understand who are your users and their needs, understand visual design, 
you know, you know what looks good to, to you, but what might look good to your customers? Um, where are they going now? Where are they going? And, and what, are, what are the things that really, you know, work well? And look at good website designs. You could just, you know, Google good website or best designs and, and see what's out there. How do I know if customer's info is secure? So one is to choose a secure e-commerce platform. Um, don't store customer sensitive information, only collect data that's needed for the transaction and maintain a security mindset. This is your business. You know, you're not gonna go like in the middle of, of somewhere and just leave all the doors open, right? So you wanna, you wanna constantly keep that in mind, Main, maintain a security mindset, um, check security of your site regularly. And then refunds and exchanges have a written exchange slash return policy that's easy for users to find. When it comes to returns, there's different types of return policies. Uh, look at what might work best for your business. Would it be a seven day, 14 day, 30 day, um, no returns on certain items? For services, 100% refund within a certain amount of time, uh, maybe no refunds, or if you're not happy with our services, let us know. So did, um, I think it's important to have this information readily available uh, for folks to see. So user experience, I am a user experience designer. Uh, I've been a user experience designer for about eight years, and uh, it is at the heart of, <laughs> It is at the heart of what you all will be doing. I mean, the, the user experience is not just somebody going to a website, it's the overall experience. So one of the things that I highly recommend when you're first starting out with your website is, is not the design itself, but starting with the content, right? Determine what content you want on the site. And here are some questions to ask yourself. Who's the audience for the site? What is the purpose? Uh, what questions will be answered when people land on your site? Will you have images? Uh, what might those images be? What will people want to do on your site? So when you go through these questions, this will give you an idea of what the content will be. And then thinking about the features of the site, um, will you allow users to search? share things on social media? Will there, uh, will there be user reviews? Will you have special offers, uh, wish lists? How are you letting people know that this is a secure site? What are the different payment options, return policies, accessibility policy, and, and search? And prioritize what is needed. I think, you know, we live in a world where you know, we, we're in a panic if we leave our house and don't have our mobile devices, right, these days. So I think having a mobile first thinking uh, strategy with your site, because most people these days will access their emails. You know, if you're doing email marketing, they're gonna email, they're gonna check the email and then that'll open up to the site. Um, think about the content strategy, what you want, um, store accessibility, the cost of, of the products and services, are they on par with what's out there? And then the payment option. So prioritizing what you what you what is needed uh, for your customers and for you. And then get to understand inclusion and accessibility. Ensure your site is accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, use language that is useful for a diverse audience. And don't leave any customers out of your experience at the end of the day. Nobody likes to be left out, so, so don't do that. The benefits of e-commerce for products and services that are that your, your products and your services, you know, a listing, are available 24-7 on a site. You know, customers are able to book uh, your service at any time. Advertising and marketing campaigns can be utilized through social media, search engine, uh, traffic, pay-per-click, et cetera. Customers can find what they're looking for. You can offer deals and provide detailed information on products and services. These are things that you could do, again, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I just wanna recap. One, you wanna determine your needs, your budget, and the type of platform that you want. 
Two, I find this very important, to write out your content and what your users will need from the site. Three, make the experience inclusive and accessible. And four, think about every level of brand management, which is another way of saying every point at which consumers access your product and service. Okay. And that is what I have there. I just want to open this up now for questions you may have. Yeah. Well, and here's my information, but also um, you will have these slides. They are yours. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love, uh, Regina, to talk first about a question that might be on a lot of our minds, which is if you were to point us to some of your favorite websites, websites that you think that have really done um, user experience and the online experience well, what would a few of those be? Oh, I like Etsy. I'll be real. Um, I'm a fan of the way that Etsy has set things up. I think that their search is great. Mm -hmm. um, I It's easy to find what I'm looking for. It's easy to complete a purchase. So I like things that are pretty simplified and easy. Right. Now, when you talk about something like Amazon, people will be like, Amazon, Amazon is easy. I think Amazon is easy because Amazon's been around for 20 years. I wouldn't say that it's easy <laughs> by any stretch. <laughs> Um, but I think Etsy's done a really excellent job. Great. And so an, another question that is, it, it came in uh, several times when, when folks registered, and that is, you know, I've gotten them to my website, and now we need to talk conversion. How can I get a new customer to convert without overextending ourselves as a business, without offering too many sales or cheesy gimmicks to get her there or hit yeah. or them there. Yeah. I mean, I think that if if it's if it's a first time experience and you don't mind offering maybe like a, you know, sign up for email and we can give you 10% off your first purchase. Mm -hmm. Um I think that is a great incentive for for someone um as long as it's not really hurting your bottom line to to do that for a first time customer. Mm -hmm. um, and also if you're able to get their email and, and you know, have them on a list for future, um, you know, sales you may have or what have you. Yeah. Now I'm gonna switch, switch gears over into the Q&A box here because I think a lot of great questions have come in. Um, so let's see, Sherry is asking, when thinking about language and accessibility, is there a certain use of language or vernacular that you've found more useful um with with online sites i think you know we we're in a time now where you want to be mindful of the language that you use um and not being too you know necessarily gender uh, specific you also want to be mindful that you know we we for the most part everybody is probably from from uh, the u.s and we're we're pretty intercultural in terms of of um our activities and our actions so just being mindful that you don't know who's coming to your site. So using pretty general language that could be applied to, to almost anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you say, and Catherine here is asking a great question, when you say write out your content and what users will need from your site, mm -hmm. can you dig into a little bit more of what you mean by that? Sure. Um, so yeah. think about going to a homepage, for mm -hmm. example. If I'm going to your site, what is that homepage going to be able to tell me? What is it going to be able to tell me that you offer? What is it going to be able to tell me that you do? What, what is in it for me as the customer? What am I going to get out of that? So that's the kind of stuff I mean when I, when I say content, you know, if you're, if you're a service provider, right? Let's say you do hair. You know, are you showing me images of, of, of hairstyles that you've done before? Are you showing me reviews that people have left uh, before? So that's the kind of stuff. Think about your custom, think about somebody going to your site for the very first time. What is it that you want to share about your business? I mean, if you were outside with a sandwich board, right? What would people see when they first see you? That's, that's, you know, that, that's, that's when I, when I say content, I think, I think about 
what what is it that you're trying to share what what's going to benefit the user what is a value to them mm -hmm. you you actually brought something up that hits on another question that has come in and it is um, how do you then manage the user review and what is that balance what do we display publicly what if they're negative yeah so you know sometimes they're negative you know and i in my past life we have uh, you know i've worked in places where we were like we chose to exclude some things because you might mm -hmm. right and 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 that's the truth i mean you don't have to put every single review and if some of them are negative then let them be negative i mean that's 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 somebody's personal experience um, however, I think that reviews, I mean, how many of you uh, look at reviews, right? Uh, I'm sure it's a lot of you. And so those reviews are super helpful for people to understand if, is this thing for me? You know, I, I recently bought um, some shea butter uh, from, I love this business, Hannah Hanna. They're really great, small, um, black owned um, business and they forgot something with my order. And I was like, oh no. But you, <laughs> but you know what, I emailed <laughs> them and they told me, we will get back to you within 48 hours, right? And they did, and I was able to get my item. So, you know, it, just just be there for your customers. And, and, and the review, you know, that, that for me is where, you know, I, I think, if, if they would not have responded to me, they would get a bad review. Mm -hmm. But they chose, they chose to, res they, they told me how long it would take. They responded to me. And I think that if you're able to address um, your users' needs and address their concerns, mm -hmm. uh, I think then you'll be all right. Yeah. Not, you know, not every, we're not for everybody. And sometimes our products aren't either. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> and you bring up a great point. And it's, if, you're shopping and you're able to see that a brand has not ignored the customer, but has taken action or um, instilled a sense of confidence in someone that goes such a long way. Yeah. And I'd, I'd be more likely to shop somewhere where I know that the customer is being heard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the customer and getting her to the site, uh, Lisa here is asking, can you talk a bit about SEO and organic search? Um, okay. We added a store to an existing content site, site, but we have suffered with rankings through Google, the mysterious Google. So can we dig into SEO a little bit? Okay. So for those who are not familiar with SEO, SEO stands for search engine optimization. So for example, if you go to Google, um, well, I'll just ask this question of everybody. How many people, when you go and Google something, are looking on the fourth or fifth page? Anybody here? <laughs> no, probably not, right? So those that search engine optimization is where <laughs> where uh, if you if you have the right keywords on your site, if you have the right things to this, it's a mysterious formula of what you should have. Nobody actually knows the formula to what it should be to be number one or whatever it is. Um, so when it comes to um, when it comes to the wording that you're using on the site, it should be the things that people are looking for and that hopefully will move you higher, but it doesn't always. Um, when it comes to, there, there are different ways that, that uh, searches can appear. Um, I used to, so when you typically when you search for something, you'll see at the very top, it'll say whatever, and it'll say add. That means that somebody's paid for that particular item. I used to work at a place where they'd say click on it so they could pay for it. Click on it so they could pay for it. Because every time you would click, <laughs> that person would have to pay, right? So that's where you pay. And um, um, the person asking the question referred to organic search and organic search is where things just come up, right? Um, because you have the, the, the keywords that are matching Google's formula. Um, it's a hard question. There are, there are literally experts in this area of search engine optimization. I am not one of those experts. Um, however, I will tell you that if you 
are doing things like uh, making sure that your like your images um, have alternative text to them and have um, specific keywords. Um, if you're using words that reflect the product or the, the things that people are looking for in that area, that tends to help. But that's a, that is an area where I would say look for um, expertise um, and definitely use keywords that are really specific to that product and what you know customers are looking for that's what's really most helpful for search engine optimization and if you have the money pay for the ad why not and i think it's always helpful to get a lay of the land know who you're competing against a hundred percent i didn't put that in here because you know we, we were we are very limited on our yeah. time but 100 percent do a competitive analysis of what what you know when you think about your small business right and who is in that space and when you google that particular product or even that service let's say for your uh area who's coming up first what's on their site right what are the what are the the keywords they're using mm -hmm. check them out check out your competition although nobody's your competition you are distinct for the record nobody is you so true <laughs> <laughs> so there there are so many questions so i'm going to really try and okay as yeah many as i can uh great so so megan has a product that requires a bit of education it's a newer product to the space okay um, she has a functional beverage so how can she educate customers new website visitors to go from the landing page where they're learning about this to add it to cart like what how do you introduce something totally new to a, a consumer base I would say videos and I mean, use your social media, right? Like have your, have, uh, use social media to get people, like if you have an Instagram or if you have a TikTok, you know, TikTok is blowing up, right? Use your TikTok and then have your TikTok link to your website. And then w once they've, they've seen that, right? They've seen the product, then they can go to your site and they know what it's about already. So I think if you don't have the social media component, having some sort of video, make sure your video has captions. Um, YouTube can, can do auto captions, but always just double check them to see if they're correct. But ha share a video. And I, I will say this because I can't stand these videos that are just videos with no words to them. Like describe what's going on. Right, you know, describe what this is, what it's doing. Everybody has that one good friend with a nice voice. Like, you know, you can get them to be like, this is our new beverage. Check it out, right? You know, like have, you know, or whatever, or however people interact with it. I mean, we have, we have these phones now, right? We have the camera, we have it, we are ready. We are our own production company. So. That's what I would say is like either do it on social media or make a video. Mm -hmm. And there, there are also great resources like Fiverr. If you yeah. don't have the friend with a good voice, yeah. and you might. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, you actually started to touch on uh, Jamie's question that came in earlier, which is what do you think about selling on Instagram versus getting somebody to your site and selling there? Oh, I mean, sell where you where you can sell where the people are. Right. Mm -hmm. So, again, um, having a site is not for everybody. It's not from a maintenance perspective, from a cost perspective, you have to do what is best for you, for your business without, you know, burning yourself out. Mm -hmm. So um, if 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 social media is working, or works for you, then then definitely do that. I mean, I remember early, this was in like 2016 time when when it was just in like beta, right? When on Instagram, where I was like, oh, people are gonna sell stuff on Instagram? That's so strange, what? And now it is so normal, right? So I think, you know, again, do what works for you. Yeah, it's uh, for anyone who has long followed Tori's journey, when she first started, people thought she was uh making the wrong move by having an e-commerce site so just know that times can change yeah <laughs> they can uh, um catherine is asking here um if i have an e-commerce site do i also need a personal website 
Okay, well, so that depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I think that if you have a product, uh, then the product can live on that e-commerce site. If you are, you know, if you're the owner of that business, I would say have an about page for you. If you are doing something, you know, sometimes we wear multiple hats. Um, when I have, I think I, my, actually my website is still up, my business website, Gilbert Consulting Group, but it doesn't have anything on it. It's a, it's a static site. Um, so you can, I had my personal website because I was still doing speaking and things like that. So depending on if you're wearing multiple hats, as a, you might be the business owner and you might be doing other things. So you may still need that, that other website. And again, you can just have an about uh, page about the business, about you as the owner. Um, as part of your e-commerce site. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Um, and so if we're, I know we're jumping around a bit, but I think all really important questions. So um, I, uh, okay. So the question here is, are there any UX designs for add to cart that stand out more than others? Should the CTA be designed in a certain way? Um, or are there any, additional public data that supports or displays best practices for getting customers to convert. So like, what are some of the, the industry tricks? Okay. Basically? So for those who are not familiar with what a CTA is, it's a call to action. It's that button that says, you know, <laughs> whatever it says to do. So when somebody is in the process of checking out, right? Um, one of the things that, that, kind of has dis will discourage someone is if all of the um, the fees are not showing right away, right? So if somebody's looking, they're like ready to pull out their credit card and they're like, oh, it's a hundred dollars, right? And then all of a sudden they go to the next screen and it's a hundred and twenty five dollars. What? So one of the things that I would say is to be very clear as to what the shipping is, what taxes are, like have that all available for them to see as soon as they've they finished making those purchases because that can really throw someone off in an unexpected way. When something is $99 versus $105, for some reason it hurts. Like, I don't wanna pay $105, I wanna pay the $99 I thought it was. Mm -hmm. So just being clear on that so that you can have that more of a seamless um, uh, interaction. And then for, for the calls to action, you know, big buttons, big buttons, right? Big buttons so that I can see what to do next and don't make things small or hidden. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard a lot of things about a three click rule. Now is that, yeah. well, should we I throw mean, that one out? When, is that one true? The thing is it's not always possible. Right, it's not, it's a nice to have if you could have like oh, but it's not always possible. Sometimes, uh, depending on, you know, is it how are you uh, allowing folks to pay? Are you connecting to PayPal? If they're connecting to PayPal, that's kind of taking them out of your experience and then back to the experience. So, these are things to consider in that checkout process, right? How somebody, how you want to have people pay, what integrations you're going to have uh, with the site. Um, so it, it all depends. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a, a great question from, um, from Carla, who I, I think this was largely in response to like, should I have a website or not? Yeah. And she's, uh, heard the, if I don't have a website, I'm not serious about my craft mm -hmm. critique. Um, she is making custom apparel and and gifts and has started with a Wix page, but didn't feel that the template met her needs, canceled the renewal with the page without going live. So feeling validated that websites aren't for anyone. Do you have advice for folks who are getting that sort of feedback? Like it, your business must not be credible if you don't have the site. How can you develop that credibility on the other channels? Um, I would say that you can, you know, create a, a like a Google business page, right? If you're not, you're, let's say you're not wanting to, so one of the things that, that somebody told me, you know, I, when I first started my uh, small business, I went to every small business, like <laughs> meet up, meeting everybody. And they're uh -huh. like, oh, you know, I was working out of a WeWork at the time. And 
I I set up my 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 Google business. So set up a Google business that that makes you you know you are a legit business and if somebody goes to google you they may not see your website but they will see that you are part of google business so that is an alternative um, to having an e-commerce site Mm -hmm. um kristen here is saying that um my business is a hybrid of a subscription-based members who are with us for years and then new clients who are visiting for the first time is there a way to speak to both audiences on the site Um, We've considered doing an app for members, um, but is there a way to offer the content in a way that feels specific and inclusive, but educates both audiences at the same time? Yeah, I don't know what your site uh, has um, as part of it, but you may want to consider having um, like a a login for your existing users, um, if that's possible with your site. Or, uh, you know, you could have a members only with the password. Um, There are ways to um, uh, provide information to the existing uh, customers and then to the new customers as well by showcasing what you have to offer, right? So there are ways to to serve both. That's great. Um, Now, here's another great question. Should you allow your social media sites to converge? I have two separate audiences and e-com sites. I'm not sure if I should share links to these sites on my personal page and vice versa. So I don't want to scare off potential customers with all the varied audiences that I have. Yeah, you don't want to overwhelm people. So be mindful of who's going where and why they're going there. Um, If you're providing information about scuba gear to a beauty customer, like I don't, what do I want to, I don't care. I want my beauty products, right? So being clear of, who the audience like constantly thinking about who is my audience what do they need right and and when they come here are they getting what they need mm-hmm. so that's what i would say if if you're you're wanting to um you know you you may have different sites may you may have different offerings but what does your audience really need it's not about you right like when i think about ux i, I used to tell my students i still tell my students you know it's not ix it's not me x it's ux it's about the user right so it's about your customer and what their needs are so are you providing them with what they need on no matter what what site they're going to or what page they're going to i really like that it's ux user yeah it's for you not me not me or i speaking of the user uh this was a question that came in um from someone when they registered to attend so how can i how can I truly understand the needs of my customer and my user as they navigate on the website? Are there tools or things I should be looking for? Yeah, so, I mean, most folks start a business with an idea of they may have some customers already um, and find out what people are using that they like, right? I mean, there are so many, you know, where's a great place to look? It's also a bad place depending on what you look for, but Reddit, Reddit has a lot of answers. I there's a person who I follow who's very into beauty and uh, she's like, you know, where do you all think I go to for all my beauty information? People are like, oh, you go to Instagram. She's like, nope, you go to here. And she's like, nope, I go to Reddit, (laughs) you know, so Mm -hmm. I would say get get to understand where your users are going now and then what they what do they really like from those places that they're going now, and then how can you replicate it, but also keep your authenticity with what you're offering? Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Okay, now a data security question. Uh, How can, you know, we talked a lot about how you can be really transparent with the um, reviews and other aspects of your customer journey, but how can I reassure a customer that their data is secure? Are there things that the customer is looking for on the site? Like, is it the HTTPS? Yeah, I mean, you if if you go to your site and you don't see a lock, right? If I'm on, I'm using Chrome as my browser and I don't see a lock or it says not secure, I'm not using that site. I am not putting my bank card there. I'm not doing it. So you want to make sure that one, whatever e-commerce platform that you're using um, has been set up so that the site is secure. 
um, and that you understand what that means um, and that maybe you could inc incorporate like an FAQ um, about security and what and and what you know whatever platform you're using is what security is being used for that site to ensure customers and and yeah don't if it says not secure when I land on it I'm I'm out mm -hmm. I'm not putting my credit card there because that means that it could be exposed to anybody on the web. Well, speaking of domains and security, um, Michelle here in the Q&A box asked a question at the, the top of the program, and it was, my website provider is now charging us to use, and then she has her, her custom email and domain. Is it worth it to start paying for this, or should I switch over to something like uh, michellegreensculpture at gmail.com? Okay. So... One, I would say this is where if we t we go back to search engine optimization, where it could hurt you if you change everything, right? If people are finding you now through this website and then all of a sudden you change to something else, it could hurt your searchability. Um, so is it worth it to um, keep it and in, in having to pay extra? Or is there maybe some... Oh, that's a hard question because I would say keep it, especially if, if that's how people find you. But if it's if it's causing um, if it's costing too much, then then change it and make it something very similar. And then try to try to find like try to use those same keywords that you were using before and see if you can move your way up um, when people search for your uh, product. Mm -hmm. And uh, a piece of advice that we always give our entrepreneur community is if you are making a big business transition of some kind talk to your customer honestly about what she needs to know if she's somebody who's been loyal or or they are somebody who's been loyal and they're participating let them know where to go in the future and and bring them along for any changes you're making whether it's a rebrand or a migration or a new site yeah um, you, you want to let them know yeah and what I would say, because I was, I'm seeing people are putting things in the chat. Talk to each other. So I'm sure that some of you have uh, switched um, from one thing to another. Like for me, when I, I'll just say, when I had my my business, Gilbert Consulting Group is very long. People don't want to type all that in. So you know, I ended up buying GCG.co, right? And then people were putting .com. So then I had to buy try and buy gcg.com that was taken i had to get gilbertgc.com you know so you have to do what works for you um uh and you just want to make it sh make sure that you are still somebody that people can find mm -hmm. that is that is great advice um so let's get i think we have time for one one more uh question here yeah. um so let's see so uh, let's see. So if you are partnering with other sites, so you're selling through other platforms, yeah, marketplace, marketplaces, um, how can you maintain your, um, brand experience metrics? How, how do you ensure that consistency with your site and messaging in those relationships? And, uh, this is, this is a big question. This is uh, lots of relationship management here. So how do you one maintain your, your brand and experience, but then hold, also, how do you make sure that you're driving enough sales that those sites don't decide that they want to boot you? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that is one in part marketing, right? Um, how are people getting to know you? Um, how are they getting to know your, your site? I think marketing is a big piece of that. When it comes to staying on marketplaces, you do have to be a viable product, right? They're not going to keep a product on that's not selling. So, mm -hmm. how are you again? Uh, how are you marketing yourself and 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 getting people to to purchase your your products? I mean, for some people, the marketplace is great because they don't want to have to deal with setting up a site, right? It it all depends on 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 you and what what you have the time to put into right and the resources to put into, um, you know and and again you have this amazing community, uh, utilize this community. Mm -hmm. I mean I I think people forget that when you're doing this business that you're not in it alone. Although it can feel that way, you are not. You have a community. You can reach out. You can ask questions. Um, I think 
you all are each other's best resources. And so don't, you know, if you have questions specifically around, you know, I have a website, I have a marketplace. Does anybody else have a website and a marketplace? And what's maybe one is working better for the other and you don't have to split yourself into two. Maybe you'll just decide to use the marketplace. But that's a real individual thing. And I think marketing has a lot to do with it. So a great question actually did come in the uh, in the chat and I, I hate to not answer a question here. So we're gonna do, this really will be the last one. Okay. Um, so uh, wonderful presentation, thank you so much. Um, Maria is asking, as a product-based business, I struggle with how to organize my website. What is the best place? Where do I put my products? Do I show everything on the first page? Is it categories, new arrivals? There's so many ways to, to do it. What are what have you found to be most valuable? Yeah, I think by, again, thinking about your audience and what they're looking for, I think putting things in categories is really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I go looking, think about what someone is searching for, right? Think about yourself as you're searching for a product you don't if i want a lotion or i want a body you know i want a body scrub um i'm looking for these specific categories i think by dividing things in categories that's what people are looking for so that would be probably easiest if you have such a wide assortment having those categories and maybe even breaking them down further is is super helpful for your customers mm -hmm. but and, first categories and one of yeah. Speaking from a mistake that the foundation made early on is we thought about our categories in a way that made sense to us. And we didn't think about our categories with how our customer, uh, you know, our entrepreneur community thought about um, what they were looking for. So we, we called something words of wisdom. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> what am I actually getting? So uh, always asking that question to your point, the you in the UX. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are not your user. You're not your customer either. You might be one of them, but you're not all of them. Mm -hmm. And so what do a majority of them need? Yeah, absolutely. Well, everyone tuning in today, I, I do want to acknowledge there are so many more questions in the Q&A box and in the chat box. And we really wish we could get to all of you. Um, but I, I am sure there has been some wonderful learnings from today. And Regine, we're just so grateful for your time and expertise today. Um, folks tuning in, we have a recording. You can watch again. Slides went through in the chat, so we'll make sure you all have them. Um, but again, thank you for being here with us and, and sharing with our community. I, I, great reminders and refreshers and learnings here for, for, for me and I'm sure everybody else. So thank you. Thank you all.